I think we're about a dozen videos into this series. I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. But there are like maybe eight or 10 items that haven't been mentioned that probably are worth pointing out because you're keeping track of this and maybe trying to apply it to something that you would be interested in doing someday. Let me show you a couple of the problems and a couple of the things that we did and some of the reasons we did them that may not have already shown up in your video feed. So these LBs, that's what these things are called, are planted against the wall to facilitate electrical chases. You've probably seen them in the background of the concrete videos, but this one runs straight over and we'll show you where it emerges inside the stem wall and it creates a chase for running the main power feed to the sub panel in the shop. This one is a little low voltage thing to hide the sprinkler wire, which is direct burial, nobody really cares. It's under the ground and it's going to be running it already runs back to the main yard and over into the repair of the sprinklers that we do once the dust is settled and the smoke is cleared. And this one is going to shield and protect the low voltage for the ethernet that Ben is running out into his shop with his servers and all of his other wizard accoutrements in the house. The interesting thing here is the penetrations of the electrical out of the house before were just planted on boxes, cut through the siding, scarcely caulked and really unsatisfactory. These boards, I'm going to call it a plinth block. I don't think that's right, but whatever it is, it creates a flat substrate to attach the electrical box to, provide an opportunity to flash the top, and to be able to caulk and paint once this system is already in place. The other end of those chases is right here. Main power feed, low voltage, no big deal. I was vastly relieved when they actually hit in the cells in these blocks. Now while we're out on the front end of this, I'm going to show you the most frustrating little crack in this slab. The slab's beautiful. Dustin did great. It was a hot day, but there's lots of rebar, and it's a nice, flat, glossy, smooth slab. It's great. The saw cuts were perfect, and in spite of the saw cuts, let me show you this. This saw cut has a crack in the bottom of it. The crack comes to the edge and telegraphs right on out where the saw cut stopped. No harm, no foul. But about 10 days after the pour, this showed up. There's no reason for that except it's concrete. One thing to mention, I'm turning the electrical on this, both the high voltage and the low voltage, right over to the world's best son-in-law. Ben's going to be running the wire and nailing up the boxes and, and uh, making these things up and he's excited to do it. He loves electricity. Now he's got limited experience in residential high voltage. So I have a good friend, Kevin Eckerman, who's gonna kind of coach him along and I'm gonna be there to sort of provide horsepower when he needs it. But it's gonna be fun letting Ben wrap his arms around actually putting the conductors of electrons inside of his own shop. There have been four changes made to this structure compared to what I showed you on the plans, what, last fall? And the first of those is those hold downs that I was so anxious to use, those big stab bolts, HD7s or whatever they were that I had in my shop that I was going to use on Amanda's building to save her some money. They were so big that the actual Simpson attachment was so much more expensive that it was a cost savings just to buy the 16 inch by 5 8 inch diameter stab bolts to go with the HD5 hold downs. Beyond that, those big gnarly things that I had just would not have fit very tidily into these 8 inch CMU masonry units. So we went with a smaller hold down. That's change number one. Change number two is we put a door in the back. Ben and Amanda decided, yeah, it would be a good idea to have a door going out. It's made for hobbits. You know, they will be able to get in and out and the rest of us will have to duck. Not really. Okay, this is cutting out. It's going to be a standard height door that will give access and light to the back part of the shop. And then the next two changes are integrally related. And that is, we moved this bathroom wall out a foot, needed a little more room in there. It was already squishy, right? So moving this out a foot meant we could go with a landing in these stairs instead of winders. I didn't have to use four winders to get around this corner. I could just use one landing. So this was just a win. You know, it, it makes the bathroom much more user friendly and it made the stairway more um, useful and frankly suitable for moving big items up and down with the landing compared to a set of winders. Okay, three or four things related to the plumbing in this bathroom. First of all, 
This is an inch and a quarter electrical conduit. That rebar is nothing. It just held the conduit in place. And this is going to be a sleeve for bringing the PEX from the outside to the inside underneath the slab. That's a zero. We're going to use a mechanical vent in the wall behind this lavatory. You remember we went to a great deal of trouble to fail to show you the wet venting technique that Phil put in. But a mechanical vent in this wall coupled with the wet vent underneath is going to be just what's needed. The third item is this block out that I'm standing in. You saw it at pour time. The two inch drain line for the shower is right underneath there. And so this sand and gravel will be dug out, the pipe will be exposed, and a P-trap will be put in to come up directly underneath the center of the shower drain. Now the last item relating to the plumbing is to sort of answer a question that recurred several times after you watched me flounder with the underground. And that was, why didn't you just hire Phil to do it? Well, I'm trying to save Amanda and Ben some money. And so Phil's willing to come over and consult. If he was going to come over here and work, I mean, we'd be paying that guy. And even though he would be at least five times faster than we are, the fact is sweat equity, that is the value that you put into a property by doing the work yourself and not being paid for it, is something that is worth trying to sort of include in a project if you can. So now I'm out on the west side next to that scaffold that you may have seen me put up when I was trying to put the sheeting up on that wall by myself. And the elephant in the living room is I'm having a great time here working with my grandkids and my daughter and my son-in-law, building a building that is daunting for a 64-year-old man to build by himself. And it makes me remember that all the time my four kids were growing up, I, I thought, man, it would really be nice if when I'm an old man, I'm able to go around and build things for my kids. And here we are, I'm building things for my kids. And on the hot, sweaty days when I'm lifting things I shouldn't lift and climbing on things I shouldn't climb on, Henry David Thoreau was certainly right when he cautioned us, beware the desire of your heart, for ye shall surely have it. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.